I'd like to introduce the moderator of the panel, uh, Professor Bakchi. Uh, Sara Bakchi is a professor in the Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, along with a courtesy appointment in computer science. Uh, he is the founding director of the Center for Resilient Infrastructure Systems and Processes. He was selected as a fellow of the Institute of Engineering and Technology in 2022, and is an IEEE Computer Scientist uh, Society Distinguished Contributor. Uh, so Sara will be our moderator, and there will be uh, several other panelists uh, from numerous departments. Uh, so I guess, uh, Sara, would you like to come up? All right, good afternoon. Um, I'm uh, here going to be moderating the panel, which is uh, six panelists, including uh, Jeff. Um, we have a packed panel, so I selected the Purdue panelists with great deliberation uh, because they are thought leaders in their very diverse technical disciplines, um, and they either extend the foundations of AI, uh, like Joy and Shang Yu, or they stretch the frontiers where AI can be deployed. So with Ashraf, Greg, and Mithuna. Um, I also chose them because they're great at offering provocative and sometimes contentious opinions. So I'm looking forward to a panel that's going to be vigorously debated as well. Since time is short, and we do want time for audience interaction, we'll have a relentless timekeeper uh, Josh, who is going to uh, keep us relatively on time. Now, for the audience interaction, there are two standing mics on the two sides. So even when the panelists are presenting their remarks, I suggest you could line up in front of these standing mics uh, so that you have a chance to share your thoughts. Since time is short, I'll stop speaking and I'll invite my colleagues up on the stage. All right, um, so the panel topic is fairly broad, deliberately so, and it says, what could AI do for us in the next 25 years? And also importantly, what should AI do for us in the next 25 years? So I would encourage uh, my panelist colleagues to chime in on this question, and they can tie the answer to this question as closely or as far apart from the work that they, they, they themselves are doing. Ashraf. All right, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I teach, I'm a semiconductor device physicist. I work in electrical engineering. And the work I do is to synthesize uh, uh, satellite information, uh, worldwide sensor information, uh, to explore the implications of next generation uh, photovoltaic and other renewable energy technologies. Uh, so in this regard, I'm really grateful for the tools that have come about uh, because that was, Jeff was just mentioning towards his end of his talk, uh, that about two years ago, uh, we needed about, uh, let's say, one year worth of computing to just generate maybe 1,000 locations, data in 1,000 locations, because this is like atmospheric transmission, very complex uh, physics of solar farms and the module technology, but once you train the data with those examples or train a machine with those examples, you can do millions of locations in less than 10 minutes. Uh, that broadens our ability to understand, uh, uh, understand the world and the implications of renewable energy in a very different way. Now, my, uh, you know, sometimes I, it's a probably Asian parent in me uh, that even when your child gets 90%, you ask that what the remaining 10%, what happened to the remaining 10%. So in that, uh, in that vein, I'd say that uh, I think in some way the machine learning approach is probably a slightly, uh, needs to move in a slightly different direction. Uh, I feel that, uh, you know, Thales is the first scientist people talk about. Um, and uh, oh, so I'm, I'm, for the time being, I think I will stop here, and I, I will I will come back to this point later on. So this Thank one you. is not counting down yet. Oh, it's not counting down. So can I continue for a minute? <laughs> <laughs> Thirty seconds. All right. 
just just to mention that I think the original data scientists were Thales and Ptolemy, because they had this big data of the ancient Greek astronomers. They crunched it into an art-centering model. And that is so accurate that for the last 2,000 years and still in planetariums these days, we use that model. So the model is absolutely accurate and completely wrong uh, because you cannot go to, a mo go to moon by using Ptolemy's model. So often ingesting data and finding pattern, it does not really answer the deeper question. You need a Newton or you need a Chomsky in terms of understanding language and physics better and I think this synthesis of large language models as well as the uh, physics and structure of language, that needs to happen. Otherwise, it will continue consuming more and more energy, and it will get bigger and bigger, and that's probably ultimately not sustainable. Thank you, Ashraf. Joy, if you would chime in. Uh, sure. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, so I work on uh, like trustworthiness of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and also their application in biomedical domain. Uh, so I would like to speak about this question from the perspective of maybe how AI can help healthcare. Uh, so first of all, as we see from the great talk by Jeff, uh, AI is a powerful tool to process the large amount of data from different scales, different modality, uh, and then that is super helpful in healthcare because it can be used for, say, processing the uh, data from clinical research, uh, from experiments, from, say, health, medical health records, and then extract meaningful patterns. Uh, one example uh, would be, say, AlphaFold from Google DeepMind, which revolutionized our understanding of proteins and their interactions, and recently they expand their discovery to more molecules beyond proteins. And this is essential for us to uh, enhance our understanding of molecules that are essential to our life and also enhance our understanding to see severe diseases and also open the doors to accelerate uh, scientific research and also see drug design. Uh, secondly, uh, like for AI in healthcare, uh, the beauty of it is it, it can be tailored for each individual so that it can uh, like create tailored, say, treatment, prevention, or health tips. Uh, and then this is feasible by considering, say, different people's uh, background and information in terms of their difference in, say, genotype, phenotype, or living environment, everything. And this tailored design and health tips can make uh, the, the prevention, the treatment to be more effective and also make our life to be better and benefit a lot, uh, like a wide range of people. Uh, and in the future, I would imagine we may have say personalized medicine, personalized treatment, or like personalized vaccine, so and so forth. Uh, and the third perspective, I'll say uh, AI in healthcare will be, it actually brings the service closer to people. So nowadays, for example, if I have some symptoms, then I would make an appointment with my local hospital, go to the doctor, ask for help. Uh, but this takes time. And also this is especially difficult for people in the say, unprivileged community if they are far away from this or say, critical services. But with the help of AI, like with say, Gemini, uh, with uh, large language models, with VR models, we may bring the service closer to people and then they may get maybe similar level of service in the future from their mobile phone, from some wearable devices. And this is especially important because for some severe diseases like uh, cancer, like Alzheimer's disease, people found that the treatment is especially useful in the early stage of the disease. So if we can get a better say, management or monitoring of our health status in a more timely manner, then we can take proactive prevention steps to uh, like even before the onset of the symptoms that can reduce say, the risk of severe diseases and benefit a wide range of people. So yeah, those are my two things. Thank you, Joy. Um, so with Jeff, uh, we already heard about lots of great things AI has been able to do. In fact, in your TED talk, you were talking about how multimodality is one of the frontiers, but it's a sign of how quick things move, that a big part of your talk was about successes of multimodal learning. So put on your imagination hat and tell us what it could do in the next 25 years. Yeah, I mean, first I'll point out 25 years is a, quite a long time in this field because it's moving quite quickly. Um, you know, I'm very excited about a few different broad areas. I think healthcare is a great one that, that uh, Joy outlined uh, because so much of making 
health decisions should be informed by all past evidence and data we have about past decisions that have been made. So if we you know, set aside the complex regulatory and privacy issues and have a North Star of how could every past decision be used to inform every future medical decision, I think that would be good. And I think you'll also see the ability to use a lot of health-related data that is not clinical in helping make the decisions. Like I wear a heart rate monitoring watch, but my clinician doesn't get the time series of my heart rate monitoring watch and use that to inform you know, what, what they do in their decision making. I think AI in education is another really amazing thing. You can give access to all educational materials in any language to everyone in the world and enable people to understand, you know, the, the system could understand what helps that person learn the best. We know when you have personalized tutors, human tutors, your educational outcomes are two standard deviations of higher than a more traditional classroom setting. And I think AI might enable us to have individualized tutoring settings for everyone in the world. That would be amazing. Um, I think robotics is a field that is going to be dramatically changed by the ability of robots to operate in messy environments like this one or your, your home or an office setting where uh, you can instruct the robot with real high-level language commands. Right? You can say, please go into the kitchen and you know, wipe down the table and bring me, a, bring me the bag of chips that's in the third drawer, and it will go off and do that. Um, so I think those are, those are some areas that are definitely going to be changed a lot. I think there's a lot to get right, and, and it's important to get it right in a lot of these application areas um, so that we do the best thing for, for humanity and not the worst thing. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Xiang Yu. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Xiang Yu Zheng. I'm a, a Samuel Conti a professor from Computer Science Department. I've been working on AI security for the past uh, 10 years, focusing on uh, finding backdoors in AI models, preventing uh, user privacy leakage, and recently a large language model alignment. In the past four years, we have been uh, working in a government uh, project called Chojo AI. This is a program focusing on uh, identifying backdoors in uh, AI models. Backdoor can be injected into uh, models through data poisoning. For example, by poisoning the training data, you can inject malicious behavior. This behavior can be triggered by specific input patterns. So in this program, the government actually trained hundreds of uh, uh, models. It's a multi-year, multi-round competition-based uh, program, right? So in each round, they train hundreds of models uh, from a selected domain such as uh, computer vision, natural language processing, object detection, and then half of this model actually have backdoors. And then the government wouldn't tell us which one have the backdoors, and then we are challenged to, to develop technique to find out these uh, backdoors uh, with a uh, limited amount of time. So in the past few years, uh, Purdue team has been doing very well, and then uh, we won about 13 out of the 18 rounds. So uh, forward looking in the next 25 years, right? Um, Personally, I believe right, AI will change our lives substantially. They're outperf uh, outperforming uh, humans in many aspects. However, I'm a bit pessimistic about the uh, secure application of uh, AI models from our uh, research experience. So AI are being increasingly used by attackers to serve their malicious purpose. For example, there have been a lot of reports about the success of attackers using AIs in uh, social engineering. For example, crafting a spam email that look real, right? So these are examples of just uh, AI uh, overpowering humans. So in other words, in my opinion, I think we need a, a agenda, a roadmap for both the public and private sectors to ensure the secure application of AI models. Thank you. Thank you, Shang Yu. Greg, take us out of our data centers and into the real world with your work <laughs> on transportation and tell us where AI is going to take us there. Sure, my, my pleasure. Uh, my name is Greg Shaver. I'm in mechanical engineering. I'm also the director of the Herrick Labs and the director of a new research consortium uh, focused on called the Smart Crossroads, which is focused on freight and logistics. My area of focus uh, is in commercial vehicles. So everything from powertrains that use uh, machine learning and AI and other techniques as well uh, to determine faulty behavior and then make decisions around, can I continue to operate this machinery? maybe with a slightly different control strategy, or do I need to stop and, and halt operations? So adding resilience in systems that move people and freight, including food and medicine, is something that's very important. 
not only in the United States, but everywhere around the world. And so those are the types of problems we're working on. We're also working on problems that have to do with improving how we harvest food so that we can get into the field and get the food out of the ground, the corn, the, the wheat, the soybean, uh, in, the, the efficient, in an efficient, uh, environmentally friendly and effective way, um, while reducing the exhaustion that um, people that are involved in that process every year, sometimes a couple of times a year, they go through during the harvesting process. So we've been working with companies that include John Deere to develop strategies that partially automate the, the harvesting and the, the grain transfer operation from a combine to a tractor-driven grain cart. Um, we've heard that it could be, a, it'll likely be in the next two to three years that uh, some of that technology that we help develop, they'll take to market. So that's very exciting to see that kind of impact. Uh, that work included um, the use of um, uh, assessment of LIDAR systems, also camera, and, and, and physically-based models to understand what's the nature of the grain pile in a tractor-driven grain cart so that we can know how much more we, where and, and how we can fill that grain cart without spilling the grain on the ground. Uh, very challenging to do that because of uh, dusty conditions, poor lighting, et cetera. So how we did uh, work on sensor fusion strategies to combine physics together with what the stereo camera or the LIDAR system could see. At the Herrick Labs, we're doing other things as well around uh, improving indoor air quality and the experience that people have, occupants have in buildings and the way they interact with technology so that they can make decisions around their comfort and also their economic uh, requirements and, and specifications. Uh, we're also doing work at Herrick around uh, microgrid type technology. Uh, I think that we will see automation in heavy vehicles before we see it um, in passenger cars at scale. That's just my view. And it will start with one truck following another truck. There's a couple of companies that have tried to bring that to market and, and they haven't succeeded. I think a lot of that has more to do with um, less the technology readiness than the readiness of the market. There's a number of other challenges right now around emissions regulations that that, that industry is focused on. But I think we'll see that come and we'll see it, it happen with an improvement in, in safety as well. Thank you, Greg. Um, and now we'll hear from Mithuna on his take on this. Thanks, Saurabh. Hello, everyone. My name is Mithuna Totetori. I'm a computer architect from the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Um, before I jump into my spiel, I want to set up uh, this structure where there are three pieces here. One is, um, as Jeff introduced in the beginning of his talk, the fact that AI is giving us new capabilities, things that we did not think machines could do, they can now do. Right? That, is, that is the central pillar on which everything else stands. But once that is in play, once these new capabilities have come in, downstream of that, there are two separate bins that I want to focus on. One bin is, as they develop these new capabilities, we want the scientists to develop them unencumbered by any notions of efficiency and all that. It wasn't possible, we made it possible. That's what we want them to focus on. But once they've done that, there is a set of people who want to jump in and make it more efficient, more secure, more reliable, and all that, right? That is where I see uh, my and my colleagues' work come into play. We focus on things like hardware-level sparsity exploitation. Jeff Stock mentioned sparsity at the model level using their mixture of experts and so on. But there was also this other piece in his talk where he said, uh, look what model size gives you. You know, the 20 billion parameter model is so much better than the 7 billion model. Wouldn't it be nice if the hardware and software worked to strip off unnecessary work from the 20 billion model while keeping its performance and accuracy the same? So those are the kinds of augmenting work that I would love to see. I, I want to see the frontiers of AI in terms of new capabilities keep pushing forward, but in its wake, I want us on the hardware side to come and make it more efficient, more power efficient, and highly performant. To that extent, um, I, I know Jeff's talk again. I, I keep going back to his talk. It was a wonderful talk. He mentioned the focus on dense linear algebra accelerators, right? dense matrix multiply, dense matrix vector, and so on. Uh, that is great. That we want all the bleeding edge work to happen there, but I hope to see uh, you know, sparse hardware, highly efficient uh, hardware for ML come out 
soon and uh, be more deployable at the edge and at uh, on-premises and so on. Uh, and finally, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the final bin. It is wonderful that when these new capabilities come out, those capabilities, we have a rich domain of experts, healthcare and transportation and all these guys who say, OK, there is a new capability. How quickly can I simply you know, drop it in into my problem and get better results? And even if not able to just drop it in, how quickly can I adapt it with minimal changes and you know, add value to the problem that I really care about? So in all of these things, I think that these three bins will each push forward with the central pillar. The new capabilities coming on, that's the most exciting thing, but making it more efficient and applying it to more human-focused problems, that's going to lead the way for the next several years. Thank you, Mithuna. Uh, we are going to live dangerously. I'm going to go off script, and before we come to the prepared questions I had shared with the panelists, let's take a few questions from the floor. So let's have a question from here, and then we'll go to a question from here. So if you would introduce yourself, um, and others who want to ask questions can also line up in there. And if your question is geared toward a specific audience, uh, specific panelist, please do that. Otherwise, you can leave it for the general uh, panel. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank Jeff for your great talk. Uh, my name is Ying Han. I'm from uh, Purdue ECE. I'm a final year PhD student, and I may join Google in a few months. Oh. Uh, yeah. Welcome. So um, my question is that before those foundation models like Gemini and ChatGPT are released, um, researchers propose different models with different architectures every year. But now the models are just getting bigger and better. So do you think we still need new architectures? And I also heard that Yang LeCun from Meta uh, mentions word model a lot. So what are your thoughts about the next generation of AI model architectures? Yeah, I mean, I think you know we've got some architectures that we understand and know how to make work well. But I do think there's lots of room for you know, uh, architectural innovation. So I think a lot of it is the proof is in the pudding. And you can actually demonstrate better capabilities at small scale. You know, that's actually what we do in next generation Gemini models is we have a smaller scale testing environment where we're testing a lot of different architectural ideas or new optimizers or new data sets. And we want to understand what does that capability look like in terms of giving the model a certain level of accuracy or performance and how much compute do you need to put into the model in order to reach that level? And if you look at architecture A versus architecture B, and architecture A can do, do this with 20% less uh, training flops, you know that's good. And then you also want to look at the downstream inference flops. So I think that's a really good way to evaluate architectural uh, innovation is at a small scale on a matched flop basis, how well does your idea X compare with the best thing we know now? And with that, you can actually do a lot of innovation and exploration. Um, so, Great. Let's take a question from here and just keep your question short so we can get through as many questions as we okay. can. Thank you for uh, presentation. My name is Austin Lim, and I'm working as a machine learning engineer at Miraflow. Uh, my question is, do you think AGI is valid, I mean, artificial general intelligence. No me? comment yeah, would Jeff. be the answer, but I'll let <laughs> Jeff say that. I mean, I I've often find people don't define that term very well when they're talking about it. Yeah. I usually like to think in terms of what are the capabilities of a system. And, you know, often people think of AGI as can it do, uh, there's a big difference between can it do any task as well as a human versus can it do any task better than all humans, right? That is an enormous rift in capability, but people kind of sweep it under discussion as, well, that's AGI. And like, if you don't specify clearly what you mean, I like to think of you know, these models as being able to be, achieve new, new tasks that they couldn't do before. And that set of tasks is kind of you know, expanding all the time as we build more and more capable models. So that's generally how I like to think about it. It's a little more concrete and specific than AGI, I guess. Okay. Thank you. All right. 
Hi, I'm Shamali Chatterjee, Assistant Professor AB and ECE, and I have a question regarding your sparse computations comment. Uh, so I work on machine learning for small devices, and therefore sparse computation is very exciting uh, to me. So two questions. One is how do you think these sparse computations will affect the robustness and interpretability of models? One is that. And the second is what will happen to all the uh, hardware that is now for dense matrix computation? What's going to happen to it all? So can they coexist? Yeah, I think... Uh... As my colleague said, there's a bunch of different levels of sparsity. So there's individual sparsity, like if you have four values and two of them are zeros, the hardware level is very good at exploiting that in certain kinds of architectures. And then there's higher level sparsity where I have a whole part of a model I'm not even going to look at in order to make the flow of the request through this model activate only this part and not this part. And I think in some sense, the higher level aspects can actually aid interpretability, I think, because often you want to understand what parts of the model are most relevant and it's deciding it wants to activate. And that can help you understand you know, what it is the model is latching onto and why it thinks it's important. Um, so it may, may help interpretability. It may not hurt it much. Uh, but it certainly can be an aid to performance at many different levels. Yeah, thanks. And the second question, what will happen to all the current hardware? Like, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think you will continue to use it, and then the, the hardware that is being built will reflect the, the current things that we want hardware to do, or really you're trying to predict what do we want hardware to do three years from now and to five years from now, because that's sort of or three to six years. And that's a challenging thing to do in a fast-moving field, because you know if you look six years ago, what architectures were we using? Like People were just barely starting to think about transformers, and now that's sort of mostly what's used. So you have to have a, a little bit of a crystal ball designing computer architecture for AI yeah, these days. All right, let's ping pong. Question from here. Hello, my name is Amir Siruri. I'm um, an economist at the business school here, assistant professor. Um, and part of my research is economics of innovation with a focus on artificial intelligence. Uh, the question that I have is um, with the increasing dominance of industry, um, in producing scientific knowledge in artificial intelligence. Uh, what do you see as a role of public policy, and in particular university, um, in creating the next ImageNet 2012 breakthrough? In terms of like creating benchmarks or creating new... new Alternative approaches to AI research other than deep learning, for example, uh, could, yeah. be, could be one, one aspect of it. Um, I mean, I think this sort of transition of sub areas of computer science becoming much more commercially interesting and therefore some kinds of work suddenly starts to happen in, in industry, whereas it previously used to happen in more academic settings, has actually happened many times in sub areas of computer science. So in distributed systems, you know, in the late 80s or early 90s, an academic lab could have a rack of 20 machines, and they were kind of at the largest scale distributed systems research that anyone wanted to do. And then search engines and online email hosting services happened, and all of a sudden commercial entities started to need to operate fleets of 10,000 machines or, or, or so. And that meant that certain problems of scale actually happened first in, you know, were encountered first in commercial settings and not in academic settings. But that didn't mean that distributed systems research in academia stopped. It just meant that we're, there were certain problems where the environment in which you're in are, was much more well suited to that, the kind of work happening in academia. And certain kinds of problems, of, particularly ones of scale, often were encountered first in commercial settings. And often interplay of those two is, is really interesting because sometimes you can boil down a problem encountered first in, in a commercial setting into something that can be worked on at a smaller scale, like some of the architectural discussions we were just having, like what kind of uh, you know, machine learning ar uh, model architectures should we use that might improve upon transformers? That's something that I think can be done at much smaller scale and demonstrated there at scales that are sort of reasonable in, in sort of non-largest scale commercial settings. All right, I'll jump off that question and let Jeff catch his breath and see if one of my other panelist friends can chime in on this. So as a student, you're deluged with messages of how AI is going to take over the world. 
and you're trying to figure out what discipline, what sub area of computing you want to go into. So would you have any words of wisdom for the students looking to pick their paths? Um, thanks, Saurabh. So uh, you've heard it all before. Uh, this is somewhat going to be strongly opinionated. Um, so uh, please calibrate expectations. Um, see, you've heard this before. You know, uh, computer science is saturated. ML is saturated. ML is a fad. AI is a fad. Trust your gut instinct. There are new capabilities, things that we never thought possible have come into play. And we're using those capabilities to solve hard problems. So uh, here's how I think about it. I'm going to reuse the same structure. The development of new capabilities, the uh, augmentation of those capabilities with efficiencies and reliability and so on, and new applications of those capabilities. The reason this structure is important is my advice to you as students is students face one conflict, which is primary. They have an interest. They have an overbearing love for a certain direction of their career. And the market sometimes has a direction that it's taking that's not entirely aligned with that love that you may have. In this particular case, I think these two things are actually reconciliable. Because ML is so broadly applicable, my strong recommendation is you get on board and learn as much AI and ML as possible, irrespective of the direction your career is. If you are going into healthcare economics, you still need AI. If you're going into transportation engineering, you still need AI. If you want to do fundamental AI research, you, of course, need AI, right? So um, see, this is not the time to hesitate. This is not a fad. It's 10 years in, and we are seeing some of the most exciting things come around. Don't tell yourselves, uh, don't kid yourselves. Here's my final thought. This is not about AI. It's about anything. If you go into the market and find the most expensive potato, that's the market signaling to you that you should grow that potato, right? This is supply and demand. Look at the salaries and see what skills are most valued. The market is sending you a signal. Go after it. Make no mistakes. <laughs> go after AI. All right. So first claps in the panel. All right. Can I? Yeah. Can I? I Greg I, wants to better Mithuna. <laughs> yeah, so I, I just want to say something. Uh, I, I agree with most of that. I would say that um, it, it context and physics matter, right? So depending on where and how you're going to deploy any tool, you know, if you know the screwdriver well, but you don't know how to build a house, so you don't know how to read a print, you're not going to be able to use this. You're going to be, you're going to, look, I've got a screwdriver. I can do this and that or whatever. But you may not know what the problem is that you need that screwdriver for. So I would say, and you know, even if you're focused on the the science in the, the the research of developing new AI algorithms, for instance, I would say it, at least become familiar, ideally very familiar with one or two in-use applications for it. And get that's something that we do very well at Purdue. And do that while you're still an undergrad, or if you're if you're here first as a graduate student, do that as a graduate student. That doesn't mean you don't get into the theory, you don't get into the algorithm of development, but get it get it into application. And because it's not enough to just have a bunch of data and train a model and say like I know how to use the tool, it, you've got to have context and you need to understand the physics. All right. Anything else to add? I mean, uh, I can add one thing is. You know, there is a recent finale of Car Viewer Enthusiasm. So uh, in that context, I, what I'd like to say is uh, Joy was mentioning about personalized medication, uh, medicine. And I have worked in this field for uh, almost 20 years now. So there is a study that we had at a United Nations supported study in Kenya. There were sensors placed uh, on expecting mothers. And the sensors were great here and they are supposed to be very good. And then once you put it in the field, thousands of women are having this, people sweat at a different rate. So therefore, what happened that started giving false signal. And once the husband takes his wife, you know, 10 miles, 20 miles down the road, and once it turns to be a false signal, you cannot continue that experiment anymore. So similarly, learning something early that somebody has a disease but not having access to the medication that will treat you with the disease, then it turns out that 
it, it simply adds to the stress and complication of this thing. So how these capabilities touch the society is a fundamentally different consideration. So capabilities is one thing, how it sort of works with the society and how society ultimately benefits is something completely different. So I would say that, yes, of course, do AI, but also do liberal arts, morality, science, sociology, psychology, other things, because without it, nothing will get transformed. Thank you, Ashraf. We'll go back to some audience discussion questions. Uh, hey, uh, I'm Subhav. I'm a PhD student. I have a security-related question. I think uh, Professor Shongyu and Midhun might be interested, too, in answering it. Um, so. Uh, Google's foundation models are trained on Google's copy of the entire web, but the web is increasingly being populated with generated content from machine learning models. So how do you reconcile that, both from the standpoint of like being able to provide good quality original data into these foundation models to begin with, to begin with but also for end users to be able to trust the things that they're seeing online? I think this is a uh, very good question. We have been thinking about this uh, problem for a while because when you work on the alignment problem, right, because of the model has been trained on this data that you cannot distinguish whether this is a uh, poison data or authenticated the data. I mean, it's become very difficult to to ensure the quality of the model. The model has hallucinated, the model has security problem, have backdoors. And then how do we solve this problem? I think this is a good question for Jeff, but uh, we have been putting a lot of thoughts in this as well. For example, is it possible to classify or distinguish the quality of uh, data right, in different categories. So probably Google have been doing this uh, uh, in some sense. right? And then some data you could trust, certified data, you know, uh, collected by people with a certificate, with, uh, with uh, I don't know, uh, trustworthy in some, uh, in some sense. right? And then there were data that domain specific, there were data that probably is to serve different purpose. For example, in order to know things that are good, you probably have to know things that are bad in order to distinguish the two, right? Then for those models, you probably have to use data that might not be considered as ethical in some sense, right? Um, I guess the first generation of AI model may be help, helpful in cultivating or filtering the data for the next generation of AI. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can add on to that. I agree with everything you said. I think, you know, there's a whole slew of research questions in the question you asked. Uh, one is how do you identify automatically generated content versus sort of human generated content? Uh, another is how can you watermark outputs of, of generative models in various ways so that you can at least identify is it your own model that generated this output? Um, and that you can watermark you know, images, obviously, which is kind of the classical watermarking that you might think of, but you can also watermark the textual output in various interesting ways. Um, I think data quality uh, is a much broader problem than just is it automatically generated, you know, because we know that if you enrich these models and change the train data so that you've really focused in on high quality data, which you've identified through some means, maybe human inspection, and then you train a classifier or things like that, the model quality on all the downstream metrics you care about often goes significantly up. So that is a general problem of how do you know what data you should be feeding your model to make the highest quality model you can given your compute budget. And that's itself a long active area of research, I think. All right, let's take a question from here. What will it take for NAI to ask new questions, develop curiosity, explore, and generate new knowledge and invent new things, rather than just ingest what we have already done? And if you'd introduce yourself as well. Oh, uh, I'm Shivam, master's student in ECE. Yeah, I mean, I can take a stab at it. I think in the classical supervised learning setup, you know, it's only going to learn stuff from the data itself. But I think in a reinforcement learning based setting, you are going to see the ability of models to take actions in the world and then learn the consequences of those actions. And I think you've seen this successfully applied in narrow domains. So if you think about my colleagues work on AlphaGo, you know, it generated new kinds of things that even the world's best Go experts didn't think of as strategies because it was able to explore the space of Go playing strategies. 
I think what we ultimately want, though, is for us to be able to generate new understanding in much broader, squishier, open-ended domains like all of science, right? <laughs> if we could do that, that would be amazing for humanity. And I think there may be ways in which some aspects of science can be automa automated in a way you can form a hypothesis, carry out some actions, extract a reward function from those experiments that is either positive or negative, and iterate that process. And that in some narrow domains, you can do that fully automated. Maybe you can do this with a human in the loop and the system is suggesting some experiments and the, the human is sort of curating mm -hmm. out of this 100 list of experiments, I'm going to do these three because those seem the most promising. There's a lot of potential here, but I think that's ultimately what we need is the ability to explore some space and then get action and feedback. So on that front, Jeff, you showed what the image net the automated tools have become more accurate than humans. Mm -hmm. So when you generate content like this, who's going to be vetting, checking the content if they exceed the cap capabilities of humans? Hmm. I, I mean, one thing we do purely to avoid having to have as many humans look at outputs is you can have another model that critiques the output of the first model. And these two are independently generated, so there is some uh, cross-checking going on? They don't even have to be, they could be fine-tuned on the task of like product providing evaluative critiques uh, versus generating output. And then, so they derive from the same base model, but slightly different. Got it. Got it. Question? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Fize. I'm a senior in ECE. So this is a question pretty much right to Jeff Dean. Uh, so, I mean, like you showed in the demos, Gemini is technically beyond the state of the art. Uh, but my question was sort of like, Google is also a for-profit company. It's not just technical motivation. So my question is, if Google's AI products had the same public adoption as, you know, OpenAI or Microsoft, how might that change the current and long-term product plan for Google in general? I, I mean, I think if you have really capable models, that improves your ability to have a wide variety of product impacts, right? Like the more we can build basic capabilities like I showed in, in the talk into some of our products. And if you look at our Cloud Next conference, which happened yesterday, there was a whole bunch of announcements of Gemini being put into, you know, the slides product for Google to help you automatically generate, you know, nice looking presentations or to summarize things or to help you write docs. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy, it's not hard to imagine, you know, a thousand ways you could use these capabilities uh, across Google. Uh, some of it is constricted a bit by the most capable models are still quite expensive to serve, and so you can't put them in the highest volume products, uh, like in the middle of every search query, it's challenging to use the absolute largest models. But, you know, uh, to the point of working on more capable systems and higher performance ways of deploying these models, that, that, innate, that broadens out the set of applications you can, you can make these models to. So. All right, let's take a question from this side. Hey, uh, hey Jeff, uh, my name is Li Chi Guo, and, and I'm a third year PhD student uh, working on the AI for science research. Uh, you share something like the AI for weather, AI for medical uh, system. So in your opinion, do you think the large language model is able to help us with the science and physics understanding? Like for example, for material science, is Google currently working on uh, things like combining the uh, large language model together with, say, material discovery, stuff like that? I have a skipped slide in my presentation on material uh. design, so <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what you're seeing is uh, often you can actually use scientific data and existing sort of traditionally written simulators of important scientific properties in order to then train machine learning based models that give you uh, much higher accuracy and much faster, well, maybe the same accuracy, but 100,000 times faster. And that really changes the kind of science you can do because now all of a sudden you can screen 10 million molecules while you go to lunch instead of you know, being able to screen 1,000 in a month of computation. And, and that fundamentally gives you, as a scientist, a, a really amazing new superpower tool that you can use to explore 
your space more quickly or to identify new connections between things. And I think that that is sweeping nearly every field of science today is to the point of how do we take these capabilities and apply them in lots of places. Nearly every field of science is saying, okay, well now what can I do in my scientific domain that is different than how we've traditionally done things because of these new capabilities. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Andy. Uh, I'm studying computer science, uh, and, I stu and I do research on broadly in deep learning and multimodal learning. Um, and I first would like to appreciate all the panels for sharing great insights for us today. Um, but I have a question directly to uh, Mr. Dean. So I was curious how you define the concept of learning in general, and as a research scientist, how you incorporate that um, understanding and scheme to better um, to um, build more uh, better and more intelligent machine learning systems. Yeah, I mean, it, it's tricky. I think uh, the traditional way in machine learning is you have some evaluation of a task that you maybe have some training data and then a separate evaluation set or test set where the model doesn't get to see the test set and it tries to generalize from the examples in the training set to see how well it performs on the test set. Um, and then obviously you have to be careful about things like leakage, you know, maybe there's similar kind of data to the test set on, on the data you trained on if you trained with additional data. Um, and I think one of the challenges with these very general models is you really want them to do everything or nearly everything you would want uh, a computer to do. And so that means the set of evaluations you need is very broad, like I showed all the different academic evaluations. Um, we also have a bunch of internal ones for downstream product capabilities that we care about that we use in the upstream training process of Gemini to make sure that what we actually produce not only does well on academic benchmarks, but also on downstream product capabilities. Like uh, many of them are multilingual, for example. We want multilingual capabilities uh, for these models to be good. Um, but I think it is a problem. How do you evaluate, you know, increase? I think what you want in general is benchmarks where the, mo the current models of today can show a glimmer of doing something sometimes, but not very often. Like if you get 10% accuracy or 20% accuracy on a benchmark, that's awesome because now you have a metric and you can say, well, why am I not getting these 80% of questions right? What am I doing wrong? How can I make my model do better? If I'm already getting 80 or 90%, it's not that interesting because they're, it's already quite capable. That may be good enough for most applications. But if I have a math, challenging math problems and I get 10%, that's fantastic because now you have this awesome road ahead of you to, to figure out why. Thank All you. right, I'll jump in with a question uh, of mine. So, so we talked about reliability and security challenges of AI. So put on your academic hat or put on your engineer deployer hat, deployment hat. How reliable, how secure does a technology have to be before we can declare success, before we can say, let's roll this out? Does it have to be more reliable, more secure than today's rule-based human-operated systems? Probably yes. But how much more reliable, how much more secure does it have to get before we declare success? So I would like to comment on this first. I think there have been a lot of uh, progress in the past few years. For example, a lot of these uh, large language models have gone through a strong alignment training to make sure they um, align with the human values or behave like human. And then a lot of models have strong uh, output regulation, like the Google Gemini, right? They actually check whether the output by the model are uh, toxic, are poisonous, or unethical. And then a lot of vendors also start to limit the access to the models. So they will not only allow you to assess the APIs without access to the internals. This actually stopped a lot of the uh, previous uh, attack vectors. For example, the traditional adversary attack that required the gradients, required a white box access to the model, they're no longer feasible. Right? However, there's still a lot of uh, uh, open attack vectors, like the black box attack that's still available. And then uh, open source models, recent research shows that you can easily disable their alignment training. And then this model can be interrogated and forcefully put into a position that they will so serve the, the, the attacker in the malicious tasks. So in my opinion, we still need a lot of work, for example, to stop those attack vectors before we can uh, really trust these models and believe they can serve the humans in a, in a good way. All right. 
question, please. Yeah, um, my name is Olive. Uh, I am a software engineer working in AI and machine learning in Google. So it's very nice to see Jeff here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my question is, um, despite all the exciting progress of large language model, uh, for a lot of large scale applications, especially those that require uh, low latency and large traffic, it's still, we're still not there to serve those large language models. And a lot of those applications are still powered by the traditional machine learning models, like building like TensorFlow or PyTorch. I feel like those two different type of models are developed in relatively different approach. Like as I mentioned, like, uh, like the, the traditional models are usually like we build like TensorFlow and PyTorch, but all the large language models are developed by like JAX. Like I think those are very different languages and require different systems. Um, my question is, what do you see those two type models in the future? Do you see large language, models, large language models to be more powerful and more efficient so we can just get rid of the TensorFlow models entirely, or there will kind of be less and less barrier between the two so they can, they can coexist in the future? Yeah, I think there's a few different things. I mean, I think one is the scale at which you have a model with a certain capability. How can you get that capability out to more people? And one way you can do that is work on efficiency so that you have now smaller scale models that have the same capabilities. And one way is to use that large model as a teacher. Uh, things like distillation and so on can actually help you get actually quite capable uh, models that are much, much smaller than the, the original teacher model. Uh, the second is there's a lot of work on various efficiency things like very low bit quantization of these models that can make them work on much smaller you know, hardware deployments or in phones or, or things like that. Uh, and I think you'll see more and more of that happening. Um, the largest scale models are often chosen to be optimal points for uh, getting the best accuracy with a given training budget. But I think if you start to look at the given training plus inference budget, then things like overtraining smaller models where you make many passes over the same data set uh, but with a model that's much smaller, actually start to make a lot of sense instead of just making a single pass over your data. Um, in terms of frameworks and so on, I think you'll see more and more interoperability or it may matter less. Like what you actually care about is what is the API to the model that I'm trying to use and how can I you know, fine tune it or, or prompt, prompt it in the way that I care about. So. We have time for one final quick question before wrap up. Please okay. go ahead. I uh, hope I live up to the expectations, first off. <laughs> um, hi, Jeff. Uh, my name is Arif. I'm a final year undergrad in CS. Uh, I won't lie to you, my latest achievement as an AI researcher is a rejection from CVPR. So I'll, I'll speak more honestly as a system. Don't feel bad. Here. There are many papers rejected in my career as well. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, it was a rough workshop. Anyways, um, what I wanted to ask about is kind of the, the state of where hardware is going. Long before I was born in 2002, there was a networking boom that occurred and uh, basically made the way for way more fiber optic than could have been seized by the market at the time. We couldn't see it, but maybe 10, 15 years down the line, that led the way to um, YouTube or Netflix or other extremely high performance things. I personally believe that we're going through that phase again right now with uh, compute. And while we can't see it as the median consumer, uh, in another 10 to 15 years, like you guys talked about, there's gonna be more compute so that normal ragtag teams could do something like this. Um, talking to an undergrad that's about to graduate in a month, what do you think they should be on the lookout for with this basically 10x compute that's gonna come in the next two, three years that can't recently be met by the market? Yeah, I mean, I think what I would say is the frontier, like the absolute largest scale model of today, you need a certain level of compute, but that tends to drop by like 5x or 10x, even in a year or two. And so that puts, you know, the largest scale thing suddenly within reach of many more people, or maybe not an individual with a bunch of GPUs in their desk, but, you know, a, a much smaller organization can all of a sudden train quite capable models that were state of the art a year and a half ago. Yeah. And apply them to all kinds of interesting problems, right? And so I think ultimately what you care about is how do you identify really interesting problems? How do you figure out what you can do that will help solve those problems that other people are, are maybe not doing, and how can you have impact in the world? And that is, I think, what we all want, is how do you yeah. identify 
awesome things. Go work with people you enjoy working with and, and have impact. Hold on, before I go, uh, last thing is, how did you actually do that, finding Sanjay and solving things like MapReduce or Bigtable, TensorFlow, things like that? So I think that may be a long answer, so let's take that <laughs> offline. <laughs> we, uh, Jeff will have about 15 minutes here when he can mingle with you in a more informal setting. So uh, let's bring the actual panel to a close and let's give a big hand to all of our panelists, Mithuna, Greg, Changyu, Jeff, Joy, and Ashraf. So I had a few takeaways. I'll spend 30 seconds. One is we are technology optimists at heart and for very good reason. Look at the advancements we've made in single modal learning and multimodal learning over the last five, seven, eight years. That's tremendous. We are, feel like superpowers are available to us today. Looking forward, three things came up. One is we have to very actively be working on efficiency of these models so that they can be run on a greater variety of different kinds of devices. Second is the security and the reliability of these models have to be amped up quite a bit, especially as we are now going to rely on imperfect, noisy, possibly maliciously moderate, um, manipulated data. And the third one is that the context is very important. And if we can get our AI models to work from small, narrow contexts like AlphaGo for playing Go to larger and larger contexts, that's going to be the big win. With that, uh, we close the panel. And thank you for all being here.